Welcome back to the channel guys. We are ready to move on. So we're going to move over to the automatic sync section of the database here. And the reason that this is important is because with Morales, you have access to a server and that server has a database where current users, transactions and tokens are automatically synchronized. Let's just load up a database. So in here, if we go to the dashboard, we will be able to see down the left hand side that the users that have authenticated with applications connected to this database have already had information like their Avalanche or AVAX balance, Binance smart chain balance, tokens and transactions, ETH balances, um, owners, tra uh, NFT transfers, token, all of these different tables have been created automatically. There are also a couple of custom tables in here as well. So. If your user is authenticated, perhaps using MetaMask or Wallet Connect, then you'll automatically have all of that user's information in the database. And the server will monitor these addresses automatically for new transactions and transfers and add it into your database for you automatically. But there will come a time where you will want to watch an address that has not authenticated previously with your application. You might want to watch a particular smart contract event such as a transfer function or something if you're using like an NFT marketplace, let's say. So this section of the documentation is going to talk you through how you can create synchronizations to specific users addresses or specific smart contract events. And I'll also give you some tips of how you can avoid some potential problems in the address casing section. So let's jump straight into this. We'll start off with the first section on the left hand side, user balances and transactions. Okay, so the first key point to recognize here is that Morales tracks everything in real time. So when you add an address to be synced here, it will pull that information in directly for you. So sync and watch address is the first one that we will cover. And that is quite literally watching a specific address. What you'll need to do is log into your database, into your dashboard section. You'll need to go and view the server details. For example, like this. And on the right hand side, click on sync, add sync. And the first one we're going to look at is sync and watch address. Now, depending on the server that you have created, your options may be different. For example, the server I have right here is a main net server, which means we have access to the main net chains. What you'll then need to do is choose the address that you wish to sync and then choose whether or not you want to sync the historical data as well. Or do you just want to sync information from right now onwards? Just be aware here, because if you're looking to watch an address that's incredibly active, it might have hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of historical transactions. So you just need to make a decision of whether or not you think it's worth having all of that additional information or not. But of course, many addresses might just be personal addresses and there may only be a hundred or a few hundred uh, historical transactions. Once you've added an address that you wish to watch and you've chosen the chain, click on confirm and then once you close this screen and go over to your dashboard in the left hand side you will see watched ETH addresses and this will be where that new address will appear. If an address appears in this list then on the left hand side it will automatically pull in the information relevant to the chain that you selected. All of this data will be populated depending on how active that particular user address has been. Let's go back to the documentation. Historical event limit, we've just explained. If a sync job is created that would result in retrieving 500,000 or more historical events, then the option will be disabled and no historical data will be populated or pulled into your database. It just means you need to contact support to upgrade your account. Just have a think about whether you really think that's necessary to do so. But for most of the time, you probably won't come across this. So that is the syncing of an address. And so you can do this one of two ways. You can either go directly into your dashboard and manually sync to an address for each one that you want to use by clicking this every time and adding a new one. If you just have the occasional address that you want to add every now and then, then that's fine. But there will be times where you might want to sync multiple addresses or, or many of them. And this process may be time consuming for you. So perhaps you want to do it using some sort of user interface from your front end or, or something like that. So there may be times where you want to programmatically add an address to the sync and watch address list. So I'm going to show you how to do that as well. And this is a simple application that I've just put together to demonstrate that. So there are two particular functions or three functions in this little app. The first one is to automatically add address to watch. And if you just choose your address, 
It's for the ETH chain only at this stage. Um, you can easily modify it for Binance Smart Chain, uh, AVAX or Polygon, but this is just ETH. You add the address that you want, choose whether you want to import or not the historical transactions. And when you click that button, it will run a cloud function that automatically watches that and adds it to your watch list. The function below has two things. You need to get the addresses. If I just refresh this, for example, it will be empty. If I get the addresses here, this runs a function that searches the authenticated user, which is me, and it looks inside the watched address table or watched ETH address table here and pulls in all of these addresses. The reason it can do that is because right now that particular table is open for public reading. And the next thing I can do is, for example, select one of these, copy that address, put it in here, destroy the address, and it will remove that address. So if I go back to the back end and refresh that, then that address will now have disappeared. If I want to then go back and add that. I can just simply paste that back in there, maybe import the transactions, press import, and then get the addresses again. And you'll see that it's now added to the front end. And if we refresh the database, it will have also added it here as well. We just jump over to the Visual Studio code and take a look at how those functions were written. And this is the code. So this is a single page HTML document. Inside the head, I've just initialized Web3, Morales, jQuery, and Bootstrap. I've installed a Jumbotron. We've got the add address section with some inputs and a button. We've also got the destroy address with some inputs and a button. And then I've got my main three functions, which would be run an import of an address, uh, destroy an address, and get the addresses. To run an import, all I'm doing is just collecting information from the user interface and just deciding whether or not it's true or false that the switch for historical syncing is on or off. And then when I've got the information that I need, I run a cloud function, morales.cloud.run. I run the watch ETH address cloud function and I pass it some, some parameters. I need to pass it the address to watch and I've specifically used this to lowercase method here, which I'll cover why in a moment to do with address casing. And the second parameter is sync underscore historical. And that information comes from whether or not the switch on the front end was true or false. So that's this particular first function. And that function runs whenever the button run import address is clicked on the front end. And that button would be this one. If we scroll back up, the next function, destroy address, that collects the information from the front end, and then it runs another cloud function, uh, which is called destroy address, of which it passes through the parameter of an address, and I get my address from the front end. Once that cloud run has completed, after I await it, I then rerun the get addresses function, which we'll cover in a moment, and that just populates the addresses on the front end. Get addresses, it collects some information, from a query in the watched ETH address. So you morales.object.extend the watch ETH address table. You then create a new Morales query. I've called it monster because I copied the code from the documentation. That was what it was called. I didn't change it. And then I just run a query.find to get a results object. I then create a connection to an, an empty div in HTML. Make sure that it is empty. And then for each one of the results that I get back from the query, I run a for each loop, create a new list element, give each list element an ID of the attributes address. So basically when you create this find, inside of this find object, you go into it, into the attributes, you will find the Ethereum address. We'll cover that more in the database section of this course. And so I will give the list element an ID and also the text will be the same thing. So the text and the ID will be the Ethereum address. That's it. So there's two new techniques in here. The first one is to do a database query to get all the information and then populate that information on the front end. And then the second one is to run two cloud functions that have the effect of automatically syncing and watching a particular Ethereum address. If you wanted to watch a different chain, for example, AVAX, Polygon or BSC, then you would just simply need to hook into a different table when you are running these cloud functions. The destroy address would be the same cloud function, but the table that you're running or adding an address to would be different. So I'll leave how you handle that to you guys as to switch between the different ones, depending on what address the user wants to look at. OK, let's go back to the documentation and we'll scroll down. Monitoring authenticated users. We've pretty much covered this. This just really goes on to say that anybody that authenticates with your application will automatically have their transactions and token transfers and NFTs and balances synchronized into your database without you having to do anything. And the Morales server will in real time insert and update data into your database. So you can just, with simple database queries, use that information 
in your application how you need to. Feel free to watch this video for more information on Ethereum real-time and historic transactions. Monitoring non-authenticated address. It's pretty much what we've covered so far already. That's when you want to add somebody else's address to your watch list. They would be non-authenticated. They haven't logged into your application. So you want to watch them. And an example might be something like a centralized exchange's hot wallet or something like that, or an active user of a particular application. Whatever it might be, you would add a non-authenticated user to your watch list. And this section of the documentation makes a reference to live queries, which we'll cover in a bit more detail when we go over to the database section. But that essentially, once you have added an address, will allow you to make a query on the data that's in your database and subscribe to that. So you would get real time alerts if something was to happen with the data in that table. Watching an address from code, we've just covered that. I've just run through that function with you. You can run a cloud function inside your application that will automatically add an address to whatever table you are looking for. This example is a watch BSC address. We were looking at watching ETH addresses. Whichever one you want to do, you just simply change this to either ETH, BSC, AVAX or Poly. When you are automatically populating this information from these cloud functions, just be aware it doesn't return anything. So you're not gonna get any immediate feedback from these. It will just do the job and add the information directly into your database. Okay, moving down, unconfirmed transactions. Transactions on any chain, any uh, mainnet or testnet can take a while to be confirmed. So when Morales does actually find that a transaction has happened, it will oftentimes go into a pending table first and then merge with transactions once it's confirmed. So I would normally have an ETH transactions pending table here with maybe two or three transactions. And once they've confirmed, they will then remove themselves from that and add to the master table. And you'll see here that in the actual transactions table, there is a field called confirmed and it will either say true or false. Let's have a look. So inside of the ETH transactions table, if you scroll all the way to the right hand side, you will see that the confirmed field is here. And there's another thing to be aware of here, and that's to do with triggers, which we haven't covered yet. But it means if you are using a trigger, for example, an after save trigger on a collection, this might fire twice when it flips from confirmed false to confirmed true. OK, let's go down to disabling user historic sync. We already know that Morales will sync the past transactions of the users, but it is resource intensive. So there will be a load on the server, both the CPU and the RAM, which you will be able to find in here in the dashboard each time that process is running. So if you don't need all of the history of your users, then consider disabling the historic sync in the server settings. How do you find the server settings? Well, let's go over to our dashboard and we'll click on view details. We'll see the settings option here. And then we scroll down the historic user sync option is there. Okay, back to the documentation. Now, if you do disable the historical sync of transactions, you can still use the Web3 API functions to go and get information from a particular address. So it doesn't mean that you're gonna lose out on the information completely. You'll just have to go and collect it a different way. We've covered the Web3 API functions already. You know how to find the endpoints from the server dashboard. Uh, on the left-hand side, the endpoint section is here. And of course, we've covered it in our SDK version in our previous section over here. There may be cases where you do not want to disable the historic sync for the simple fact that you want to use database queries. But we will cover that shortly. OK, smart contract historical events will still work. It's important to just make a distinction between two specific things here. The first part is when you add a smart contract event watch or a user address balance watch, a specific address that you want to watch like this, for example, that is one way that automatic information is pulled into the database. The second way automatic information is pulled in is when you have an authenticated user. So all of your user addresses and balances will be pulled in. So there are two different ways. One is automatic when a user authenticates with your application. And another one you've manually added to watch an address. So if on your database you disable this automatic syncing, that will only have the impact on your users that are authenticated. So meaning anything that you manually add will still continue if you've selected the import historical. I hope that makes sense. So manually adding an address or an event to watch works independently to the disabling of that previous setting. Excellent. Optimization is an example of how you can save some CPU and RAM usage is effectively disabled historic sync of the users and just adding a smart contract event sync for the token smart contract. Contract event sync we'll be covering shortly. 
And the collection schema really just talks about how the information appears inside of all of these automatic tables. There could be multiple tables for transactions, token balances, NFTs, etc. And it could be cross chain, so you could have all of those multiplied across all of the different chains. And so there are some standards as to what appears inside of those tables. This is an example of the schema for the transactions table. And you can see the types of fields that are available and the types of data that it stores inside them. And this will all relate to the tables that you'll see inside of the database for transactions, for example. Across all the top here will be the, the fields that, of which it's related to. And it's the same for token transfers. This is for all ERC20 token transfer events. Token balances. So that's user balances and watched address balances. NFT transfers, once again, that's for users and watched addresses. And that will be for both 721 and 1155 tokens. NFT owners, it's the same idea, both for users and watched addresses. And that is automatic syncing for user balances and transactions. Let's go and move over to the smart contract events. We briefly touched on these already, but the reason why you would want to watch for smart contract events is because you want the ability to have real time alerts, for example, if something was to happen inside of your application. If you're running an NFT marketplace, for example, you'll want to know or be able to handle when somebody creates a new NFT or offers an item up for listing or there's been a bid on that particular item or an item has transferred. Each one of those events that happens will be emitted as part of the smart contract and you'll want to be able to listen to those smart contract events in real time. And we got you. Luckily, Morales Server has the functionality automatically built in. You can add the specific smart contract event listener. So take a look at this video by Nicholas here. It goes into some detail. And we'll move down to how to define a smart contract event sync and watch. Once again, once you've completed this process, it will add information directly into tables in your database. And to do that, you will need some information specifically from the smart contract. You're going to need two or three key pieces of information. The first part will be a topic. The second one will be the ABI. And the third one will be the address. You'll need to get that information prepared before you start this process. Once you have that information, you'll then need to decide the table name, which would basically just be the subclass, the table of where you'd like your data stored. I've created a one here called notes. That's my table class that I've created manually. And then you would be able to do the same thing here. So just a quick overview description, just to help you identify what this sync and watch contract event is for. The topic, that can be provided in one of two ways, but essentially this will be listening to the definition for the particular event that you want to sync to. In this example, the event is called bet and it's passed in, removing all white spaces, just the types of data that that event uses. You don't want the names, you just want whether it's an address or a string or a Boolean or an unsigned integer. That would be the topic. A uh, second option is you could provide a hash of that particular topic string. The ABI, you should know where to find that if you've created the smart contract yourself. But if you're trying to watch somebody else's smart contract, then you'll need to find the ABI and collect the information from the event that you want to watch. Again, this video goes through that in a bit of detail for you. So go and watch that. The address is the smart contract address that you want to listen to. Create your table name using camel case and then you can add that. So let's have a look and see what the fields look like here. And then we'll just close this panel here or we'll go over to the sync, should I say, and then we'll click on sync and watch smart contract events. And again, you choose the chain that you want to be watching for. ETH mainnet, for example, the description can be anything you like. Uh, you can choose whether or not this particular sync and watch event will pull in historical data. So you can choose yes or no there. The topic, again, that is based on the event that you want to watch. So if we go for an example over to Etherscan, and for argument's sake, let's just look at Uniswap V2. And let's just choose this one here. Factory contract. We'll just go over and have a look at the contract side over here. Or perhaps the events tab, should I say. And there's an event here called pair created. And you'll see here that you've actually got the topic right there. So if you copied that and come back over to our dashboard, and I'll just paste it in here for now, just so we can see it. You'll see that there are data types and also names. You need to remove all of the names and just be left with the type of data that it is. Remove all of the white space. 
you can see there's an address. See there's an unsigned integer 256. There we go. Just remove all of the white space. So you're left with the name of the event and the data types inside of the parentheses with no white space. That would be an example of a topic. Then what you're going to need to do is go and find the ABI for that particular event. Uh, if we go and take a look at the Etherscan, let's just paste that in there, for example. Back over to Etherscan. Uh, let's go to Contract. And we could do a search for Pair Created, let's say. Uh, well, that's lucky. Okay, so under this, we have the Contract ABI section. And in here, you can see Pair Created. It's a type event. So you could copy out all of this JSON in here, or all of this data, and go and collect the specific object that relates to this event type. Copy that into your ABI section here. And then put in the contract address that you wish to watch. Create a table name. Press confirm. And then you will be watching for that particular event. An example of a valid ABI, you can see here you've got the curly braces. You just need to make sure that you pass it in like that. And this example, it says here it's a bet event. And you have all of the previous information there as well. You need the entire object for the ABI. If for whatever reason the ABI data contains an ID input, then this will automatically be passed to UID because, because ID is a reserved input in the Morales object. And on that as well, we may as well just explain that the underscore, the name fields also doesn't work. So for example, if it has something like name underscore side, whatever it might be in here, then any of those underscores will not work. You'll have to rename or change them in order to make it work. And if you need to edit any of the information, then you can do so by going into your dashboard and clicking on the edit button. But right now, if you do activate this edit function, you are going to need to provide a new table name, which means that this is a potentially breaking change. In the future, we will re-examine this and update the process for doing so. But right now, if you need to edit this watch event, then you'll need to create a new table name. Now, earlier on, I mentioned that if you get limited based on the number of results that your historical uh, events or transactions will be pulling in, then there might be some additional steps that you'll have to follow. For example, if you start the sync job that would result in retrieving 500,000 or more historical events, then the sync historical option will be disabled and no historical data will be fetched. The contract event or watched address transaction will still be monitored by Morales, but it requires a trigger to tell Morales what to do with the data. So you'll need to use a before consume trigger. Triggers will be covered later on in the course. But if you do not use this before consumer trigger, then the default behavior would just be to skip the event and log a message to the dash dashboard. Here's an example of the before consume trigger. So if you always want to save an event, and you could use this example here, but if you only want to save the event if the transaction is confirmed, so it doesn't do a double call, then you would be able to use this. And that is for smart contract events. And the last section of this part of the documentation is to do with address casing. I've covered this briefly when we looked at the code just a few moments ago. In the code, I use this to lower case method on the address. Now, the reason why that's important is because whenever you go and fetch an address, let's say, for example, from Uniswap here, if we wanted to use this particular contract address for whatever reason, you'll notice that some of these letters are uppercase and some of them are lowercase. Whenever you want to match an address inside of your database, it needs to match the cases. And the database addresses are always lowercase. So if you matched the, the uppercase version to the lowercase version, it will return false. And then, of course, you're not going to have that information pulled in because it doesn't recognize it's the same address. So it's always a good idea whenever you're doing this in your queries to use the to lowercase method. Very, very important. Superb. And that is the automatic sync section. The next section is going to be pretty detailed. We're going to jump into the database, start doing queries, objects, live queries, have a look at security and roles. And there's lots of great stuff to jump into. This is where your application will start to come alive.